What I want to do this morning is to simply continue where I left off last week. And so that is in Acts in chapter 9. And you uh, remember, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure, the, the light that arrested Saul, or as he was to become known, Paul. And I said last week, I might get the, the names mixed up and call him Paul sometimes and Saul another. But um, it, it's um, Saul of Tarsus at this point that was arrested on the road to Damascus. And I want you to get a clear picture of what was happening there because that's really the center of it all. And I don't think too many believers these days realize that. What Saul of Tarsus saw on the road to Damascus was a light, and you could say, without being poetic, it was a light greater than 10,000 suns. He said it was brighter than the noonday sun, a light which all through the Old Testament has been introduced to us as the radiance of the presence of God. Uh, sometimes in, in Hebrew, it's called the Shekinah glory, which was inside the Holy of Holies. Uh, it would be, if I could say, a gentle light. It was not a harsh light, for it is the radiance, the, the reality of God's love is so real that it appears as a light, such a brilliant light, but it's the light of love. It, it is the light of wholeness and health. It, it is the, that is holiness. It, it is it's the gentle light, the kind light. It is God himself embracing Saul in the light. And in the middle of that light, almost radiating from him was the light, stood Jesus. And that is what creates the New Testament right there, that you have the man, the man, dare I say, the human being, the man, Jesus, and he is standing in the middle of the light. And in fact, the word would indicate the light was coming from him. He was the source of the light. And so in the minds of a Jewish person of that day, that you, you are in utter confusion. But what you would know, the light is the presence of God. And here, inside the presence of God, and the presence of God inside him, stands a human being. And that is absolute contradiction. How can you have a created human being standing in the light who is God? And that is what arrested Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And I say again, that is the essence of the new covenant. And out from that light, the person Jesus spoke and said the words that we've been looking at, Saul, Saul, which is, is beautiful. It's the personal name of, of Saul. It will be the name that his mother called him when he was playing stickball in the street. Because Saul makes a, a note, he said, he spoke to me in Hebrew, which means the private language of this particular family. They didn't speak the street language, Aramaic or any, they spoke the pure Hebrew tongue, very few people did. And, and he said, he spoke to me in Hebrew. I say, that's the way his mother called him. And she would call him in Hebrew to come and get dinner. And here he names, he, he hears his name in Hebrew being called out of the light, his personal name. And then the question which arrested me, and I hope it's got into your heart and head too. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why? And it was that, why? Why do you persecute me? Um, the, the very question was a confusion because Saul thought he was doing the great work of God. He saw himself as a, a reformer, somebody who was rescuing Israel from this traitor, this heretic, Jesus. But the question begins with why, and that is, is the big question to me. You see, why 
it's a good question to ask, you know, <clears throat> a lot. Why? See, it cuts behind all behavior. If I say, what are you doing? Then I'm addressing your immediate behavior. But why? That goes behind the behavior. And behind the behavior, it takes us down to our emotions. What, what is the emotion that drives me to do this? What am I feeling right now as I do this? Why? Why? You're not interested in what your hands are doing or even what your speech is. At this point, I'm getting down to the engine that drives it. Why? Why are you doing this? What is going on inside of you to cause you to do this? Why? Why? It, it gets down to my attitude, which is, as uh, I've said many times, you don't say a word with attitude. It, it, it's totally an energy that comes out of you. Well, where's it come from? Why? You, you could say that of the person that you know who has an attitude. and. and just you remember, I, you know, your teenager sitting there saying nothing but with an attitude. Well, the real question, though, it's hard to get through at that time, but why? Why? I, I know what you, I can see what you're thinking. I can see what you're wishing you could say. I can see a lot of things, but why? Now that, that goes down. That's, that's put on your diving suit. You, you, you're getting down into the very heart of the human being to our motives, which means our hard beliefs. In fact, it is getting right down there to my basic belief about who is God and who is myself. And it will amaze you that many things that we do, which seem to be nothing, but you start asking why, and it comes back to who I believe God is and who I see myself. And that was the question. Oh, Jesus is brilliant. Brilliant. So, so you've seen me, and that could be the end of the road. Well, do you have any questions left? I mean, here I am. No, it doesn't go that way. Because if so, Jesus appearing to Saul would have been just sort of the cherry on top of the cake. We, we've got to tear this cake apart, and, and we've got to have Saul of Tarsus confront himself and realize who he is, what he's been doing, why he's been doing it, and how what he's now seeing is the total answer to it all, even though it will destroy him. Um, did you see the point? Um, why? Why do you do this? Um, why? Well, why? See, Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee which, as I believe you know, was a cult within Judaism. Today we would call it a denomination. It was a very, very rigid, law-keeping group of people. Pharisee, we believe, comes from a word meaning separated, which means we are the separated ones. We have separated ourselves to keep the law and they were arrogant and, and rude in their beholding themselves as the ultimate law keepers. And therefore, they were um, fanatical about the basic beliefs that Lord our God is one God. And the Pharisees were the ones that interacted with Jesus negatively so many times. And we have no evidence that Saul was in Jerusalem for those interactions, but he would certainly have heard about it. And I just don't mean by rumor. He would have had it blow by blow. We said this, he said that. Would you believe he said that? And we said this. Saul had heard it all. And there's good reason in the latter part of that last year, Saul well might have been in Jerusalem. So why? Well, he said, this Jesus said, that he was God. He said he was the Son of God, which to any understanding person in those days meant same as, of one being with, the same as your children are of one being with you. And so he's the Son of God, then he's of one being with God. He claims to be God, and he's 
a human being, a peasant from Nazareth? That's blasphemy. And if it's blasphemy, then everything he's doing must be of the devil. And you probably read that in the Gospels, that they accused Jesus of being a witch, a wizard. They accused him of casting out demons by the power of the demons. But it was one great big charade, really, all that he said and all that he did was straight out of the pit of hell. He was a demon in disguise. That's what they said. And that's why they wanted to crucify him. Because they said, we crucify people like that. We crucify demonized people. And when they're hanging on the cross, God endorses what we've done, and he curses the people and abandons them to hell. So that's why they desperately wanted Jesus crucified, because he had claimed to be God. You see, the Jews could have gotten rid of Jesus in many ways. But no, they went to Rome and they said, you've got to do this. Why? Because Rome only had the power to crucify. They said that we've got to have that, you see. And, and, and so, that, why? You ask me why? Why? Because he claimed to be God. That's why. And we had to. It was my bounded duty as a leader of the people of God to rid them of this demon-possessed person who dares to say they're God. That's the motive that drove Saul of Tarsus. Or is it? Well, yes, it was. But keep talking, Saul. I, I want to get why? 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 Well, hmm. you see, what we know Saul did know for sure, and he knew a lot by hearsay, he knew that Jesus was supposed to have risen from the dead. He knew that his body disappeared. And he knew what the official statement of the temple was, that his disciples came in the night and stole the body. But really, in Saul's mind, that, that's all. He's gone, you see. We killed him. He was crucified. He's buried somewhere. I don't know, but he's dead and gone. But there rose up this company of people who called themselves the people of the way. And they said he was alive. And they said it so powerfully. They said, we know he's alive. Some said we met him. We talked to him. We even had supper with him. He's alive. And because he's alive, he is the one who has dealt with sin. And the law of Moses is no more. He has dealt with sin, and the way to knowing God is him, not the law of Moses. That much Saul had heard firsthand. That's when he went into the houses and the synagogues and dragged out anybody that named the name of Jesus, and he interrogated them with terrible torture to blaspheme the name of Jesus. And they didn't. They wouldn't. Instead, they said, he's alive. Instead, they said, the law is over. He is now the way. Instead, they said, there's no more temple. There's no more sacrifices. It's over because he is the end. And that our sins and iniquities are remembered no more. He heard that firsthand again and again and again, which his anger rose within him. Because, you see, it's more than being a great leader and saying we can never, ever allow a man who claims to be God, who claims the law is over, the temple's finished. He wasn't just a crusader. He was Saul of Tarsus. Why? Why do you, per why do you persecute me? Annas, Caiaphas, the men who crucified him, they're not persecuting. They just want the whole thing to go away. In fact, there's nobody else of all the Pharisees and of all the Sanhedrin. Why you? Why you, Saul? You've taken it on yourself. You're the lone crusader. You're, you're, you're going to clean out all of these believers. Why, why you? Yeah, that's, now we're getting somewhere. It's you, Saul. All the other Pharisees know what you know. All the temple know what you know, but they're not doing anything. They're just, in fact, the professor that taught you 
in seminary soul, the most famous, he comes down to us outside of the Bible, his famous teacher, Gamaliel. And Saul boasted he was my teacher. In the Acts of the Apostles, Gamaliel said, quieten down. He said, if God is with them, we can't stop it. And if he isn't with them, they'll go away. So God, forget it. Gamaliel said that. Saul of Tarsus, he's foaming at the mouth. He's red as a beetroot. He said, no. Why? Because, well, he said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Remember, he said that in Philippians. He was, he was not just a Pharisee. He was, he was the poster child for the Pharisee. It was his very life. The law was everything. They called the law of Moses, which first five books of the Bible, essentially. <coughs> they called it the light. It's interesting. They called it the way. That's interesting. They called it the shepherd. They called it the great teacher. They called it the guide. Just about everything Jesus ever said was true of him. They called the law that. And Saul of Tarsus, you, you realize a, a Pharisee would begin memorizing the law at four years old. At four years old, they began memorizing Leviticus. By the age of 12, they knew the first five books of the Bible so totally that you could pick any text and they could refer it here and there and everywhere and make a discussion of the. And then at 13, they began to memorize the rest of the Old Testament. That was a Pharisee. Jesus said to them, do you remember? He said, you search the scriptures. Well, they bet you they did. They were, you want to be a Bible student? You want to get all the hanging chains in Sunday school for memorization? Be a Pharisee. They, they were dedicated. That was Saul. But a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, uh, you want to see someone who completely saturated his mind in the scripture? It's me. Is time. He didn't own his time. The law did. The days, every day, especially the Sabbath, of course, every week. But days were holy days, feast days, months of the year, his whole life. He didn't need a, a day book. He, his whole life was organized rigidly by the law, his time. He got up in the morning in his first prayer, and Jesus quoted it, but it, it, he wasn't making fun. This was their first prayer. The Pharisee woke in the morning, raised his right hand, and said, I thank you, O God, that I am a man and not a woman. I thank you, I am a man and not a dog. I thank you, O God, I am not as other men. I am a Pharisee. That's a great way to start your day. And... and um, from then on, every hour had its hours of prayer, which they always made sure came around when they were in the marketplace. And so they would stand in the marketplace and give long prayers to show how holy they were. And he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. They fasted every week, went without food in order to pray. Even their possessions were not their own. The law took it. Their 30% of their income was tithes. Don't, don't be, I mean, the evangelicals say tithing is 10%. That's just because they went slide in under the door. But no, in the Old Testament, it was 30%, uh, 20%, and then a, a third one that was spaced out over a bit. But, but not, not only so, the first of anything you grew in your garden belonged to the temple, belonged to the law. And that was called the first fruits. And, and uh, and the Pharisee, the Pharisee, do you know they even went in the garden where they were growing onions and garlic and they would count them, one, two, three, and the tenth one, that belongs to God. Oh, tomatoes, one potato, two, <laughs> number ten, belongs Pharisee, Pharisee. And, and of course, his attitude to the world reeked. That's why they hated the Pharisees, even though they respected them at the same time, because they thought they're so holy. And they thought God was like them. They hated women. They would despise women. Um, I, I'll just leave it at that. 
illustrations could go on till noon. It, it, they just despised women. They despised anyone that was not like themselves. They argued for years on who is my neighbor because the Bible says, or their law said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it obviously didn't mean everybody. Who is my neighbor? That one person that may be qualified that I have to love them. And they decided it was the Pharisees. But of course, not all Pharisees are as good as me. So maybe it doesn't mean all Pharisees. It just means those like me. The rest I can hate happily. Um, that was a Pharisee. And he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's the poster child of keeping the law rigidly. In fact, I've told you before, they added 2,000 laws to the ones in the Bible. There's about 600 plus in, in the law, and they made it 2,600. And they called them fence laws. They said they're laws that stop you even getting close to breaking the law. We, we'll keep you way back here. He believed. He believed it was his life since a child. It was his life that keeping that law is the favor of God and my salvation. And not to keep it is to be damned and punished. He lived by comparison. I'm better than you. That was Saul of Tarsus. Can you understand that when he heard these people that he had arrested, say that Jesus was the end of the law? That means the end of my life. Please, do you understand that? That's, the law was not a hobby. The law was his very lifeblood. And to take away the law, he wouldn't know what to do with his day, just for starters. His life, I say it again, just would crumble, disappear. The law was his life. If I don't have the law, how can I please God? I wouldn't know how to please God. Huh. It's strange. The law was given, and it was Paul who told us this later. He really got it. But the law was given not to be kept. Did you know that? The law was given not to be kept. The law was given in order that sin might abound, Romans 5. He said, the law, what, the law was given to throw light and say, see, you can't keep it. Why did God give them the law? To show them they couldn't keep it. They wanted it. They wanted their independence. They wanted to show God we can be as good as God. God says, you want a law? I'll give you the law. And they couldn't keep it. Even though Saul said he kept it blamelessly in terms of the outward appearance of it. But when the law gets down into how you think, how you want your attitudes, I might say I love you and hate you in my heart. Do you know what I mean? The, the law goes much deeper. They didn't bother with that. Nor did they ever realize the law was given to show up sin so that man would finally say, I need the salvation of God. Why, Saul of Tarsus, why you are persecuting Jesus? Because he of all men, Pharisee of the Pharisees, he of all men knew that Jesus was taking away from him his control of his salvation. Can you get that? As far as Saul of Tarsus was concerned, he was in control of his salvation. If I do this, then God will have to do that. If I do this, then God will have to favor me. I'm in charge. I thank you, O oh God, that I am who I am. I thank you I'm not like the riffraff. I, you know, he's in control of his own salvation understand that? Because I know a lot of people think the same way, that you take away all the do's and don'ts and they fall apart because that was their salvation. What they do, what they don't do, then God must respond to that. That was Saul of Tarsus. And, and huh, I suppose you could say it all came down to Saul of Tarsus saying, I have done. 
and Jesus smiling his smile of love and saying, I have done. It is finished. That's the clash that came between Saul. Or you could say, Saul lived by one phrase. If, then. If I do this, then God will do that. That's the law. Again, let this sink in. It's, this, is, this is the gospel. We're getting to it. This is, but Saul had to face this. He, his whole gospel was, if I do, then God will do. God responds to me. Whereas Jesus was saying, because, therefore. Because I have done and finished the work. Therefore, you are free, accepted, included. He's in control. You make the response. Do you realize it's absolutely upside down? The law says you do, and if you do, God will respond. Jesus said, I have done, therefore, because I have done, therefore, you are free. And you are included into the family of God. Huh. Why are you persecuted? Why? Why are you doing Because you're taking away my life. You're taking away everything I know of salvation and distinguishment. You're taking it away from me. And you're saying, I can't do anything because you've done everything. I've got to kill you before you kill me. Because if I believe what this Jesus believed about himself and what you believe about it, if I believed that, it would destroy my life. I'd have nothing left. So I'll shut your mouths forever. Away with him. Begin to understand Saul of Tarsus a little bit better. That man laying on his face on the Damascus Road is scared spitless. He is losing everything. He's got nothing left. He believed himself on the surface to be a crusader who was saving Israel from this blasphemer, Jesus. It could be that when he first saw the light, his immediate thought was, God is endorsing me. I'm another Moses. This is my burning bush. And then the strange words, why are you persecuting me? Persecuting? I have been working for God. I have been <clears throat> doing God's work. What it was, who, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And in his head, because he's a brilliant man, he's putting the light, the glory of God, the Shekhinah, and, and, and the man standing in it. Who are you? What is going on? <laughs> I love it. He could have said, I'm the son of God. And Saul of Tarsus would have been somewhat confused, but he could handle it. Could have. He could have even said, I'm the Messiah. Ooh, that would have been good. That would mean the Messiah is endorsing me. <laughs> I am. Okay, that's the name of God. I am. Jesus. <laughs> that's when his world fell apart. Jesus, the one he was convinced was dead and buried somewhere, was everything he said he was only a trillion times more. He's inside the glory of God. He is everything, all those that I have been beating to death. That's what they said. And he is because I am Jesus. I won't let you get away with Messiah. You can conclude that yourself. I am Jesus. 
But then he said, of Nazareth. Oy. I don't know if we, we get too religious sometimes. I am Jesus of Nazareth. I, I mean, Jesus was a very common name in those days. To us, it's the unique name. But as a name among men, it was very common. Do you realize you're, you're seeing the glory of God and out from the glory of God, it says, I am Jesus of Nazareth. It, it's, it's equivalent, and I'm not being stupid. I want to try and have you see this. It's as if you, you saw the glory of God. I am Fred from San Antonio. Um, you, yeah, I got a smile. It, it, it's, you know, Jesus gave his earthly name you can say the name of god's humiliation when he became a creature jesus but then he gave his street address <sighs> and there's people going around well they've been gone for ages and they talk about the christ and they never attach jesus to that they just say the christ and the Christ sort of has shown up all through history, wherever anything happened. The Christ, you know, floating something. Um, this kills it. He is the Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah. But not a floating nice idea since the Stone Age. That I am Jesus of Nazareth. You know, the one you are persecuting. You got me right. Dude, is this doing to you what it did to me? I mean, Jesus is saying, I have not shocked off my humanity. I still associate myself with my street address. He is human. He is absolutely organically, one of us. I am Jesus, the one from Nazareth, the one you thought died and stayed dead. But no, I am that one. You're, that's the one you're persecuted, isn't it? The one you thought was dead. It, it pulls every string together. Here I am. Now, what am I going to do with this? And th this, is, this is the gospel that I, I, I have to say multitudes of believers have not even, they've never had that why that brings them crashing down and see their entire life fall apart and left with Jesus standing in the glory. That's the gospel. What, what, what does it mean? Can, can you get it? It, it, it means, it, it, this, I don't say if this is true. Obviously, this was the biggest reality Saul of Tarsus had ever been confronted with. There's no question. He's not going to debate it. it it's here. But how can, I, how can I ever explain this to me? How? A man? And from him is the Shekinah glory, the glory of God. How can a man be God? How can God be a man? I'm not going to answer that question. I don't know. But I do say it is so. Which means that God is inside, wrapped up, one with human. That's what it meant. I'm trying to, what does it mean to Saul of Tarsus? When, it, when he faces the why, then uh, is this the one I'm trying to destroy? Is this the one I want? It's a question. God has become and is because it wasn't he was just born in Bethlehem and, and then ascended, and well, that's the end of that, isn't it? No, he's still. This is long after the ascension. 
This is still, I am Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> He's inside. This is not a ghost. This is not a phantom. This is a conversation going on. He's locked into our time, space, history, locked into our physical. And at the self same simultaneous moment, seamless moment, he is God unbegun, glorious. Okay, take, take in another step. For Saul of Tarsus, it's getting worse. I mean, if he is this 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 human Jesus of Nazareth who walked on the streets of Nazareth who had a shop with Joseph and son outside uh, who was registered with the city you know he's got a birth certificate uh he didn't suddenly appear walking down the street God's arrived this human has a history. He was born. He was born into our race, just like all of us. Your mother's birth canal is your passport into the human race. He had a mother. He was birthed. He had a nine month in the womb of that mother. He didn't, he didn't just suddenly show up next door. He started as a little tiny baby. Which means what? It means he intentionally joined us. This wasn't some pop and God is here because he has something to say and he's gone. No. He actually birthed into the human race. That's the intention. God said, I join this people. The human became one of us. You know, one of the greatest verses in the Bible to declare this is in Luke 2 and verse 11. I mean, when Jesus was born. We've, we've lost that in all the idiocy of what we call Christmas. But I'll never forget when I, I took a tour to Israel. And um, we avoided, you know, what they called the place where Jesus was born, because that's all made up. But um, I said, let's just go and do it properly. And so at night, actually very late at night, I took them out into the fields outside of Bethlehem. And there was it's Jerusalem way back there and Bethlehem. And I said, now you're a shepherd, you've got your sheep here. And, you know, you're kind of sleepy, it's nearly midnight. And, and I said, that sky over there suddenly lights up with the same, the Shekinah glory of God. And there's 10,000 angels. And then the one appears right there in front of you while we're sitting here in the field and says, fear not, it's okay, it's okay. Relax, fear not. I bring you good tidings of a great joy, which I've always translated as the goodest news you've ever heard. You know, the most joyous news, the, the, the unbelievable news. And it is to everybody, everywhere. For unto you this day, in the city of David, Bethlehem, there is born a Savior. Um, in the Passion Translation from the Aramaic, he is, is rescuer. I like that. Unto you this day is born the rescuer. He's come, the rescuer. But then, in our Bibles, it says, unto you is born it's a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. We've totally lost it. We just sing that away in, well, if we ever do sing carols anymore. Uh, and, but it's just, it's along with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know. It's, now, come on, come on, come on, come on. Listen, a rescuer, who is Christ, that's Messiah, the Lord? We've been around each other long enough. You know what that is. The Lord. 
is I am Yahweh, the name of God given to Moses. That baby wrapped up in blanket, strips of cloth, is the rescuer who is none other than the Messiah, who is none other than I am God himself. You want your mind blown. You just think about it. We, we, these people were facing it for the first time, and so where do you go with this? From before time, before time, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they determined that we shall be created, we shall become one in fellowship with the Holy Trinity plan, and then creation, and the promise to Eve, and the promise to Abraham, and the promises, promises, and the great decades and millennia, promises. And now it's going to happen, and when it happens, what do you hear? A baby screaming. It's gynecology. Do you realize everything from before time ends with gynecology in a truck stop in Bethlehem where they had their camels and everything else, the 18-wheelers came brought along. And, and here's a baby who cries the first cry of life. And he is, I am. It, it, it means there's no one and no place where he does not know and feel. It means that I am knows what it's like to spend nine months in the womb. It means he relates to every baby, which means he relates to every aborted child. He relates to every stillborn child. He relates to every miscarriage. God, creator, upholder of the universe, has been inside a womb and knows baby before birth. He has lived a five-year-old. God has entered into the mind of a seven-year-old. He's been a 10-year-old and 11-year-old and knows by experience what such go through. A 14, 16, 18, 25. Do you get what I'm saying? This is God who joined us intentionally and became absolutely and utterly one of us. And John puts it verbally as he became flesh. And flesh is, is this. It's, it's finding my um, reality within the limits of my mortality. That this is, this is life. This is where it's all. Over. But it's more than that. Flesh, how can I put it? Flesh. Flesh is that, it's the poisonous sap that comes up from the roots of the human race into every branch of the tree. Flesh is the broken, distorted, twisted lies that pour out the great lie of the Garden of Eden, the system of the lie, the doing of life by the lie. And God came into that and felt every lie and looked at every distortion and saw life as Adam saw it and simply said no. He refused to believe what Adam believed and instead Within human, he believed the Father and trusted the Father and so converted the human to the mind of God. Oh, but just a minute. If God becomes human, he can't just become one. I mean, he did. He had a street address. He was Jesus of Nazareth to make sure you don't think of another Jesus from Bethlehem or something. This is Jesus, you know the one, from Nazareth. He was an individual. 
but he is God who has gotten inside our humanity. But God created all. And therefore, if God is inside our humanity, then this human is more than an individual. This human includes everybody. Every human has to. And that, I'm not preaching, that's logic. If God who made all there is becomes one of all that is, then that one equals the rest of all that is. I'm trying to get inside Saul's head. As he saw, God became a human, a human, a human. I'm used to prophets. Prophets who got close enough to God to hear what God was saying and then came back and said, you know, what I heard? But they only heard a bit. And I say, well, what does he say next? I don't know why I, I came to tell you that. I, I don't know what he said next. So I have a bit, half a sentence. That's how Hebrews 1 puts it. Bits and pieces, jigsaw puzzle bits that prophets came. A holy man who hears God, knows God. Uh-uh. That, that's exterior. They're there. I'm here. I listen. I come and I tell them. It's good. It's good. Prophets are good. But this one is not a prophet. He's inside the glory of God, which means he comes out from God. God from God, not from beside God or over there listening. No, this is God from God to tell us what God is like. But he had to come on the inside of us. Because if he just told us, it would go in one ear and out the other. Or it would go into the sieve of the lies and be twisted and distorted before I even heard it. That's why people get so many different opinions about the Old Testament. Because just here, here, God says, I'm coming inside you and I'm going to think God inside of you. I'm going to break that flesh, and you'll see and you'll hear inside human what God is really like. And he didn't do that uh, by chance. That's intentional. He intentionally was born. He intentionally lived that life. And this is where Saul really came into it. He intentionally let us torture him and crucify him. If you've heard 1% of what I've said, you don't torture God. He could flick you away with a little finger. Do, do you follow me? Are we so materialistic in America we don't think about that? You know that? Torture God? <laughs> Shall a mouse take over a herd of elephants? I mean, it, what are you talking about? Torturing God. Well, he kind of anticipated that, didn't he? When they came and they brought 600 men to arrest him. That, that's a joke, isn't it? I mean, they're going through the trees of the garden, all their torches flickering and their swords in there. They're coming to arrest this man, the gentle Jesus from Nazareth. And he steps out, you remember? Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Bam. 600 men fall on their backs, swords flying, torches in the underbrush and things, stuff, fires starting, and everybody wants you. And he stands in, looks at him, and then kind of, I better help you up. You don't want to arrest me, don't you? Come on. He made it plain right from the start, the very first act of the torture process, he made it plain, I'm in charge here. I'm letting you do this. I'm playing into your hands. This is necessary. It's intentional. And we've seen it. I'm not going back there. It was in that that he forged a relationship with us at our worst so that we gave him our sin we gave him curse we said crucify him and he took it for i am has laid on him the iniquity of us all he took it and he became 
but he, he, here it is. How can I say this? Holy Spirit, give me words. <sighs> Jesus was not doing something for you. It, it isn't that Jesus sat down with the Father and said, now let's make a deal about these people. You do something to me, I, I'll, I'll take it, and, and we will then have a contract of salvation. I can go and give them, and I did this for you. You get salvation. That is if they say the right words, because that's very important. Um, this is where, this, this, that's not the gospel. I don't know what it is. I wouldn't even bother to go there, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is God became human, which included then every human. For he is the God who made us and holds us together, the glue of our atoms. When he becomes one of us, then all of us are involved. I mean, if he's the creator and we're what he created, if he ceases to be, what happens to us? We cease to be. Do you get that? Well, now... That God has become one of us. My, my existence is tied up in him. My, my, my hope, my being is all tied up. What happens to him happens to me. And he now is intentionally stepping in to my shoes. And he intentionally, the cross tells us this, intentionally, he said, give to me your guilt. Give it to me. And when you give it and call it mine, I, I won't contradict you. I'll accept it, never saying a word. Give me your pain. Give me, give me all the abuse that you've had in your life. Give me all of your shame that you've kept in secret. Come on, give it to me. And I become it. Go on, you can sit down over there. Because I now am you. What happens to me is happening to you. I have taken your history. You are in me. C -c can you see that? Right there, then. My guilt is no longer mine. I see my face in the face of Jesus he is guilty with my guilt, but he is guilty. He has the history of my twisted, corrupt life. He's got it. And he tells me to sit down and watch. Though actually what we did was keep on giving him more. But this is the gospel. So when he is receiving our sin, which caused the shedding of his blood. He sets the tone and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We've been there too. But when he, I mean, think about this. This is you. When he, you, died, and he really did die, didn't pretend, didn't just take a breath. He remained in the grave for three days. He says, I'm really dead. But just a minute, it means that you, in everything that you are, and that poisonous sap, and everything you've done, and every motive you've had, he was you, and he died. And if he died, well, that's it. That's all that Eden ever threatened. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Or as the Hebrew there says, in dying, you will die. It's, it's going to be horrific. And the mercy of God held that back because that was never a threat. It was a warning of love. 
And it was Jesus that stepped into Adam and said, I'm going to die that death. Eden's death was fulfilled in Jesus. In dying, he died. But with it, it's over. Death is over. It's not coming back out. It's over. And it was in death that he throws it off. He is revealed to be what they never thought. Even the devil never thought it. He is the original life. What happens to death? As Paul said later, if they had known, they never would have done this. He is love in the place of fear. And fear is swallowed up in love. He's light in the place of darkness. And, and the Father, in his place as the supreme judge of all creation, says, You are my son. And you've carried the human race into death, and it's done, it is finished, and you, my son, are justified. You, my son, are redeemed. You are reconciled to me. You are brought back from the dead. And he rose from the dead. But just to use it, Jesus didn't need to be justified, uh, but he was, he was you. He stood for you. He See, he didn't do something for you. He did it as you. Your salvation isn't that you said the piece of prayer that, that is now going to connect you to something Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. No. Jesus said, I became you. I carried you to death. I carried your sin, your guilt, your shame, your grief, your abuse. I became that. And I threw it off. And the Father raised me from the dead, but in so doing, he said that you had come to an end and a new beginning, and for you to live now is Christ himself. Did that make sense? So your history, your history is that you, one with him, you have died. It's a great feeling. I don't have to go back and do 20 years of counseling to try and find out what happened to me when I was 12. Because um, I died. And I, could, I, I can think about what happened to 12 a lot more clearly now um, because I know the effects of that all went into the grave. I know that I have been rescued in Jesus. Jesus became me and I was buried with him and I was raised I was exalted with him and now I because in him and he in me we sit at the right hand of the father so it isn't this poor pathetic thing where they say that you, you believe and, and you'll die and go to heaven whatever heaven is I don't know golden streets or some utter nonsense that's not the gospel. I don't know what it is, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is a person. A person who put his arms around you and said, I am taking your place and you're taking mine. So here we go. And he carried you through death, through resurrection into the heavens, is exalted. But just a, he's still human. When Saul saw him, he was still human with a street address. That's right, because you can't live without him now. God, as human, is living our human lives. He didn't just fade off and say, well, you're on your own now. No. He became our life, period. That's it. Became our life. So I don't only share his history of dying and burying and rising, 
I am now sharing his history, and he is now sharing my life. He is now here in this room, in you, in me. And we now live because he lives his human life. God is living his human life in us. That's, that, that's the gospel. Just a minute, don't we do anything? I'm beginning to feel like Saul of Tarsus. I've got to do something. Uh, no. Um, no, don't, 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 don't turn me off yet. <laughs> but we contribute nothing to this except all our screwed upness and our sin and our brokenness and our distorted, twisted ideas about the one who's saving us. It's a work of God. God did. God did for us when we couldn't do anything for ourselves. Couldn't do a jolly thing. And he gave himself to have an organic relationship to me. He became one of the sons of Adam. So I can't contribute anything except to realize, is a good word, to wake up, to realize that he has done all, to which I can add nothing. You say, well, you, you've got to believe, I mean, you've got to repent, you know, do the whole Catholic thing of repentance. Um, no, no. What, what are you going to believe? Oh, you've got to believe. I've had this out. This is not a caricature. I've had this out with pastors and preachers on TV. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Believe what? Well, you've got to believe. The fact is, can you believe? Can you believe what Jesus believed? He believed that if he took your sin and went into your death and absolutely drowned in your hell, that the Father so loved him and so loved you, he'd bring him out. Can you believe that? Go try it. Jesus exercised the faith of God. And by his faith, he carried us to justification. He carried us to redemption. I believe, sure I believe, but I believe his belief. I rest in his rest. I trust in his trust. And as I do so, I am caught up into it. And I know that I know that I know that I believe. But believe, believe me, your faith, your faith is a response to his faith. Your faith is not in control and making things happen. Your faith is a response to him who is the happening, who is the salvation, who has done it, who is the life. My, my faith is a response to that. Not, not, you're right, Saul of Tarsus, you're absolutely right, old chap. You're out of control. You've lost the driver's seat. You are not in charge of your salvation. You're absolutely right. And yet, your whole life is going to fall apart because it's not by law. See? That's the other thing. It's not by law. Huh. Not by law. Utterly different to law because law says if you do this and you do that and the other, you'll get there. If you say this after me, you'll arrive there. Jesus said, I'm already there and you're in me. Do you see the difference? Law is always delay. Always, not for now, when you do this. Oh, God, send revival. When? Oh, you've got to get your act together. You've got to be. <clears throat> I was raised among the Pentecostals and said you had to have a big clean out of your whole being to allow the Holy Spirit to come because he couldn't look on sin. He was disgusted with you. But 
when you, 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 you're in control here, get your act together. You stop doing this, stop doing that, stop going there, stop thinking that. Then God says, I think you've got it clean enough for me. At least I can be in the living room. That's the law. That is the law that Saul of Tarsus tried to kill Jesus for in the followers of Jesus because it took everything away from him. You mean God? No, he saw, he saw it good. Do you remember what he wrote after this? He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us at our worst, joined us at our worst, and carried us with him through death. So there's, there's no do this and get there. But wake up, I'm there. How did I get here? Because he loved me and gave himself for me and carried me in himself. That's how I got there. I were yet sinners. And that's why the gospel begins with the words, open their eyes. See what is. See what's real. See Jesus, the God who has become human, who has then put his arms around every one of us and carried us with him. We say sort of a great organic blob of people he carried. Well, I suppose you could say that. But it's not like that. He loved me. How can he take everybody in the human race with him and still just love me? I don't know. It's a fantastic thought, though, isn't it? So he came. Saul was just one of the race for whom he died. But when he comes, he said, Saul, Saul. He knew Saul. Knew him. The way his mother talked to him. Saul, Saul, he comes to you, you know, Gene, Gene, you know, Malcolm, Malcolm, Jaden, Jaden. He knows my name. So he loved me. What I've been describing, though it has to be for all because it's God who's doing it, but it's so intimate it's, it's as if i'm the only one and that's why i can look at the face of jesus and see my own face and where he is i am and he totally identifies with me so that where i am he is or as paul was yet to say but he got it pretty much already in in embryo he says for me to live is christ go on you've said that so many times think about it for me to live, be alive, do my day, walk through my times, eat my meals, go through my possessions. Used to be the law, the law, the law, the law. Am I doing it right? Is God pleased with me? Should I do this? Oh God, is it your will? Why am I going to? The law, the law. Always brings confusion, anxiety. Paul said, gone. Gone! For me to live is Christ. For me to be blessed is Christ. Not because I did this, gave that, worked in this way. But because I'm in him. And as he is the beloved of the Father, I am so in him. The Father and the Son and the Spirit now dwell within the compounds of my life. I live Paul wrestles with this in all his epistles to say, he said, I live, I live. I've got to be more alive than I've ever been. I live. Yet, it's not I. It's not, it's Christ, Messiah, who lives in me. I could keep going, couldn't I? Actually, in Galatians 1, he describes his what we're talking about in a different way. He's, he's mulling it and he said, it pleased God. It's the pleasure of God, the delight of God, the smile bigger than the cosmos, God. It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. So this was happening before I was born. 
You mean this was happening before I knew your name and knew who you were? Yeah, yeah. I know you didn't know, but I separated you from your mother's womb. I, I was there at your birth. I organized your birth. I didn't show up later and say, now, who are you? <laughs> no, I've been with you since actually before you were born. I, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. Just a minute, Paul, you must have, you got that wrong. Surely reveal his son to me. No, no, no. The word is very plain in the original language. It pleased God to reveal. You know what reveal means? It means to take the covers off. You know, you were in bed this morning, and then they took the covers off and revealed you were there. You were there. The covers hide you. The bark of the tree, around the tree, you can't see the trunk because of the bark. And when you take off the bark, you have revealed. That's the word is take off the cover, remove the veil. So, so Paul says in Galatians 1, that it pleased God who had been working in my life since before I was born. And there on the Damascus road, he revealed his son. The covers fell off and I discovered who I was always intended to be. I discovered, I discovered Saul of Tarsus in the face of Jesus. I discovered I don't have an identity apart from him. Everything else I was groping in the dark to try and find who I was. I found myself in the face of Jesus Christ. It was a revelation of who I am. It revealed the intense darkness in which I'd been. This, this, you can't really say, you know, Saul decided for Jesus on the Damascus Road. <laughs> I really don't think so. I, I think he woke up to realize that God had decided for him before creation. And now he's bringing his decision into line with God's decision. Uh, he didn't accept Jesus. Don't be daft. Look what, go over and read that a thousand times. He didn't accept Jesus. He accepted his acceptance. Jesus had, prior to Saul even knowing Jesus was alive, Jesus had accepted Saul of Tarsus. It included him into his life. And, and Saul of Tarsus surrendered and accepted his acceptance into his inclusion. I, I, I heard a pastor, God bless him, and I mean that, God bless him. But he was trying to get people to, you know, raise your hand, come on forward, come on forward. It was the 200th verse of Just As I Am. And his, his finale was, come on, it's election time. Let's give a vote for Jesus. Oh, good. A vote for Jesus. You really believe that? It's all about his intentional choices about us. It's about his intentional coming. It's about his intentional taking our place and carrying us in our death into his resurrection. It's his I, I, my eyes are open. I see that. And having seen it, if you please understand me, I don't need to make a decision. I, I, I've, I've rested into his decision. I've rested into his acceptance. I've woken up. Oh. The reason I know this was about where he was thinking, and I'm, I'm done now. I've, I've gone over it. I had to say what I said. But... Three days later, three days when he was blind, talked to no one, sat in a room. I believe what I've been trying to say to you this morning is what was going on in his head. And when Ananias, Jesus comes to Ananias and says, now go, here's the address you'll find, Saul of Tarsus. It's okay, he's praying. That's interesting. Saul thought he'd been praying all his life. Jesus said he's just begun to pray. 
He's just started. All that religious stuff, forget it. But, and, and he said, I've got a lot of work for him to do. So I just want you to go lay hands on him, get him healed, and um, let's start. So you know the story. Ananias goes, he calls him brother Saul. Wow. It's like a believer in Arabia going to Osama bin Laden and saying, brother, <laughs> that's about what it was. The arch persecutor, my brother, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you in the way has sent me. He said, you've got a lot of work for you to do. So I just want to get rid of your blindness. So put my hands up. The scales fell off his eyes. I think it almost clanged on the floor. But then it says he was baptized. And baptism in those days meant a lot more than most of what people do today. You know. We're having a baptismal service on Thursday. Anybody want to be baptized together? I know you're baptized before, but yeah, it is a good day for baptism, like a barbecue. Come on, let's be baptized. Hear that over and over again. It's not that. That's just a wash on wood. When we're in Israel, people said, I want to be baptized in the River Jordan. I said, why? They said, well, I just want to be baptized in the River Jordan, you know. Sorry, find someone else to do it. Uh, no, if you've been baptized, that is something so enormous. You can't repeat that. It's enormous. It's a work of the Spirit of God. In fact, baptism is what I've taken an hour to say. I, I just said it. Baptism is waking up to realize I was crucified with Christ. Okay, baptism is physical faith. Faith is not here. Well, it is, but it isn't. Faith is not here. It is, but it isn't. Faith must encompass your whole spirit, mind, emotions, body. It's the opening of your entire being, I see. And therefore you have physical faith. It's, I, I do it. I don't sit there and I believe that. I go through the process. And they stepped into the water. And they declared their eyes were opened. And they're done with, with where they've been. And, and then they are put under the water to say, I really was crucified with Christ. Goodbye, world. I bury you. I was buried with Christ. I really was. And I bring you out of the water. I really rose with Christ. And then in the early church, they guided you out of the water and they took a flagon of oil and poured it over you. And they said, the Holy Spirit is now your guide, your teacher, your comforter, your strength, who's going to open your eyes even more to Jesus and the Father. And you wouldn't be baptized until you understood that. They weren't daft. You, didn't, you weren't joining a church by being half drowned. I mean, no, we do stupid things today, don't we? You know, baptized to join the church. Baptized because, well, it's baptizing time. And baptized, whether you need it or not, do you really need it? No, no, no. There's a baptism service in December. Oh, it's okay. No, no, no. The early church understood this is physical faith. You've seen it. You've got it then come and let's do it together, the act of true remembrance. And they poured that oil, and, and as you stood there, they said, you have entered the eighth day. Well, there is no eighth day. I know, I know. But fun. You standing in this day have entered into the eternal day of God. They did that to Paul three days after the, that meant in the three days he saw what I've tried to explain to you this morning. And the same one who caused him to see it is the same one who teach you to see it. Because otherwise I don't see it. And from there he went straight out and started preaching. Good grief. 
He'd seen something that he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Or was it now? I've got you know, four spiritual laws here. Um, could, could, would you mind if I, mind if I shared you? No. Have you heard the news? <laughs> Give me a pulpit. I've got to tell you. On that note, we quit. Okay. And the blessing of God, who is almighty love, intentional love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit open the eyes of our understanding, flood us with light. And that's the way it is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.